There's a series of questions and answers that the Buddha used to teach the Dharma to young novices. It starts with what is one, what is two, what is three, it goes all the way up to what is ten. For example, what is four? The Four Noble Truths. What is five? The Five Aggregates. Eight? The Eightfold Noble Path. The most interesting answer, though, is what is one? And the answer is all beings subside, subsist on food. <clears throat> and here when the Buddha says food, he means both food for the body and food for the mind. Food for the mind includes things like contact at the senses, consciousness at the senses, and intentions. Our mind feeds off of these things. This is why when people go into sensory deprivation tanks, the mind starts getting really weird. Now, just as food outside has both healthy food and unhealthy food, there's also healthy and unhealthy food for the mind, especially with the intentions. Our mind has a tendency to feed off of unskillful intentions, and even though they may be delicious, like some kinds of unhealthy food, they lead to trouble down the line. So we have to learn how to eat properly by finding the right kinds of intentions. But even then, as long as the mind is, is in a position where it has to eat, it's going to suffer. As the Buddha said, suffering is the five clinging aggregates, and the word for clinging, upadana, can also mean to, t to take sustenance and to feed. We're in a position where you have to feed on things, no matter how good they are. You're in an unstable position. Always concerned about how much your f source of food is going to last, dependent on things that are often out of your con outside of your control. The Buddha's solution was eventually to find a state of mind, nirvana, that doesn't have to feed on anything at all. There's no hunger. There's no lack. I mean, you don't have to feed. You don't have to hold on to anything. You no longer count as a being. This is why when the Buddha was asked, when Arahants die, do they exist, do they not exist, both, neither, he would not answer. Because we people are defined by our attachments, defined by our desires. Where there are no attachments and no desires, there's no definition. We can't be measured by anything. This is why the image they give is of the ocean. They can't be measured as to how many bucket full, buckets full of water it contains. Now, to get to that state, however, requires that we feed in the meantime. This is why when the Buddha talked about the practice as being like having a fortress at a frontier, and he compared various aspects of the practice to different things in the fortress, like mindfulness being the gatekeeper, persistence being the soldiers, discernment being the wall. He compared concentration to the stores of food kept in the fortress. When you get the mind to settle down and be with one object with a sense of pleasure, sense of rapture, that's food for the mind. Your gatekeeper of mindfulness can feed off of that. The soldiers, your persistence, can feed off of that. This is how they get their strength to keep going. When a John Fuang's analogy he said the practice is like having an engine, and the engine needs lubricant in order not to seize up and, and burn itself out. The lubricant here would be the, the sense of pleasure and rapture that comes from concentration. So the pleasure of concentration is a good thing. Sometimes you're warned that you're going to get stuck on it, you're going to go slowly in the path. And all the Buddha did recognize that it is possible to get so pleased with your concentration that you get lazy. 
But he said the dangers of concentration are nothing compared to the dangers of not having concentration. Because when you don't have concentration, then no matter how much you may understand the drawbacks of sensuality, you're still going to go back for, to sensual pleasures. And it's because people are attached to sens sensual pleasures that they can kill and they can steal, have illicit sex, or they lie, they take intoxicants. People don't do any of those things under the power of concentration. Concentration gives you an alternative source of well-being. So learn how to focus on your breath and give, give in a way that gives rise to a sense of pleasure, gives rise to a sense of fullness. You can try long breathing, short breathing, fast, slow, heavy, light, deep, shallow, any combination of those. When you find something that feels good, stick with it. If it doesn't feel so good anymore, then you can change. Keep on top of the needs of the body. And when you're able to maintain a sense of well-being, then you can let it spread. Think of the in and out breath connecting with the breath energies throughout the body. So your entire sense of the body gets fed with a sense of well-being. And as for people who say that you're stuck on concentration, well, it's a good place to be stuck. After all, it was the Buddha was in concentration when he gained awakening. So you've got good company. Simply be, be careful to know how to feed off of this pleasure. The people who gobble it down. In other words, the people who get so attracted to the pleasure they forget about the breath. That's what puts an end to your source of food. This happens all too often. You're focused on the breath, there's a sense of pleasure, and you just go for the pleasure, wallow in the pleasure. But the cause of the pleasure to begin with was the fact that you were focused on the breath. That's your foundation. When you abandon your foundation, the pleasure may last for a while, but then it stops. And if you keep that up, your, your concentration practice doesn't really develop. You're like a person who gets a job, and then as soon as you get your first paycheck, you leave work, go off and have a good time, spend all your money, then you come back and ask for the job back. Now, assuming that the, the boss is a kind person who'll let you back, but if you keep that up, quitting the job every time you get a paycheck, he's not going to give you a raise, and you'll never advance in the company. In the same way, when you get a sense of well-being from just being with the breath, and then you wallow in that and forget the breath, you get into delusion concentration, which is a dead end. In other words, you're here, but not quite here. You're very still. But if you were to ask yourself, what are you focused on, you're not really sure. And sometimes when you come out, you even ask yourself, were you, were you awake, were you asleep? That's delusion concentration. That comes from not knowing how to eat, or having no manners in how you eat. A person with manners doesn't gobble food right down. If you know that you get your food because of a service you provide, well, you pro keep providing that service, and the food keeps coming. Here your service is staying focused on the breath, being conscious of the breath filling the body, and trying to maintain that sense of full body awareness. It takes work, but that's the work that you do in the sense of well-being that keeps you clearly there with the breath. Because as the breath gets more and more refined, if your range of awareness is small, then you disappear. It's like falling into an air pocket. You drift off, and you've lost your concentration. There may be still, but there's no mindfulness. 
So do the work that needs to be done. And that way that you'll have food that you can draw on all the time. As you get used to this food, then you start thinking about other things the mind could be feeding on, and you begin to lose your interest. This is much nicer, this is much less, much less harmful. There are a lot of pleasures out there in the world. At the same time, you, as you develop more refined taste like this, you get a more refined sense of what's going on in the mind. This is why concentration is a basis for discernment. Because you have to be very careful not to be overcome by the pleasure, to hold on to the perception of the breath. This gets you more and more sensitive to the process of perception, the process of thought fabrication in the mind. And you can be, begin to see how these things can contribute, even a sense of well-being like this, they can contribute to a, a little bit of stress. And there is stress in the concentration. You see, sense it most as you're getting used to it, but then as you get more and more proficient at doing it, sometimes you tend to forget. But there is stress there. After all, the word jhana is related to the word jayati. It's a verb that means to burn. Pali has several different words for burning, and this is burning with a steady flame, like a, the flame of an oil lamp. It's still steady. You can read by it, much better than you could read, say, by a bonfire. A bonfire, the flames are leaping around and flickering here, flickering there. It's hard to read by them. But when the fl flame is steady, you can read by it. In other words, you can read your mind. But still it's burning. And John Lee says it's a cool fire, but still it's fire. You're feeding off a of fire. And you remember the meaning of nirvana is you're, the fire goes out. So there is more work to be done to figure out what in the mind is still causing suffering, is still causing disturbance. It's hard to say suffering at this point, but still causing disturbance, even in the state of stillness. And it's in pursuing that question that you finally get free. But you pursue the question in the framework of the concentration. Some people say, well, I've done concentration, now I need to move on to something else. But if you're going to gain insight, it's going to be here, either right when you're in, right when you're in concentration, or when you just come out. So give your concentration a lot of time. After all, it is the heart of the path. After the Buddha had been practicing his austerities for six years and saw that they were a dead end, he asked himself, "Is there another way?" And he remembered a time when he was a child, he had spontaneously entered the first jhana. And something inside him said, that's the way. So even though when they list the factors of the Eightfold Path, right concentration comes at the end, the first one the Buddha discovered was right concentration. That it was simply a matter of figuring out what other factors needed to be added to make it a complete path. There's one sutta where he says, this is the heart of the path. All the other, all, uh, seven other factors are its requisites, its supports. And as I said, it was right here where the Buddha gained awakening. His mind was in concentration. We know he gained awakening under the Bodhi tree, but that's far away. The place where he gained awakening in his mind was in right concentration. So if we get into right concentration, we're in the same place the Buddha was. And give, give ourselves a chance to see the things he saw, understand the things he understood. So don't be afraid of being attached to concentration, as the Buddha says. Indulge in it, settle in it, make it your home. Just be careful that you have manners and how you feed on it. 
and otherwise it has no drawbacks at all.